Yeah. All right, folks, thank you so much for coming today. And just a couple of things that I wanted to um, let you know. My name is Bert Matthews. I'm president of the Matthews Company and a partner at Colliers International. Uh, this is a lecture as a part of the uh, moving forward uh, that the uh, chamber is putting together. We'll be filming this today, so make sure that you're on your best behavior. <laughs> um, it'll be on uh, Channel 10 and here in Davidson County on Comcast and 99 in the region on uh, AT&T. So that's ground rule or thing you ought to know about number one. Number two is everybody that's here gets a freebie, okay? So here's uh, Dave's book. He'll be talking a lot about it, and it's a reference point uh, for many things. So as you're taking notes and thinking about things, uh, Gabe's written this. It's really, really um, uh, fascinating. Uh, number two, or number three, um, wanted to just walk you through the five goals for um, moving forward. I think they're really important and things that we need at each of these events to keep thinking about because that's what we're focused on. Um, the, the RTA and the MTA are working on a strategic plan. They're going to complete that in one year. That's going to happen in May of 2016. Our next goal is to ensure that the state and the federal government raise revenue for transit within two years. That's by 2017. That's transit here in our region. Uh, we're going to engage in at least 30,000 unique individuals in a transit discussion over the next two years by 2017. We're going to identify a local dedicated source of funding for transit within three years. That's 2018, and we're going to be in the ground with a project moving forward in 2020. So. The purpose of today is to get some really great ideas about what, uh, what is possible, but with those five goals in mind that with the end one that we're going to be underway by 2020, not that far away. So to speak to us today is Gabe Klein. Um, Gabe is an entrepreneur and he's also engaged in government and it's really exciting what he'll be talking about today, which is when we look at issues around government, transportation, and mobility, what we need to be doing is trying as quick as we can, not being afraid to fail, and recognizing what's possible in the future. We need to be looking at this issue with an entrepreneur's perspective, and that's what Gabe brings. So welcome me and having Gabe Klein come speak to us today. Thank you so much, and thanks to the Chamber uh, for having me. I think I have two mics. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, it's great to be back in Nashville. Um, I was speaking last night, and I was saying that you can just feel the energy getting off the airplane. Uh, and I've been here, I think, three times now. My, my Lyft driver, you know, I asked him, uh, how, how's Nashville doing? And I'm not going to say what he said, because we're being filmed. But basically, he was like, Hell yeah, Nashville is kicking butt, doing great. And uh, and it is, and, and I come down here and I see all this beautiful work that you've done in the bike lanes and the parks, and soon you'll probably have bike lanes over the bridge, and I mean, that is just a wonderful thing. And it's great to see southern states, and uh, I was in, in the Sun Belt last week, making progress so fast. Sometimes I think you can do more and more quickly here than we can actually up, up north. So what I'd like to do is, take you guys on what I call a PowerPoint slide roller coaster ride. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, a lot of things that are going on um, all over the country, and uh, you know, talk about what's happening now, what government is doing differently, how the private sector is interacting, and also what's coming in the future, because the future is basically now. And what I mean is that there's so much happening that we don't know about day to day. And I have a window into what's going on in Detroit and Silicon Valley and the government um, over the next few years. I'm going to try to give you some of that information and we can talk a little bit about you know, how things like autonomous cars fit into the equation in a place like Nashville. Um, but those of you that have heard me speak before know that I love to uh, 
talk about history too. And I'm a student of history because I think you have to know your past to know your future. And often we just have this frame of reference that's very limited. It's the time that we've been on the planet. And for many of us that's less than you know 70 years. So we don't remember the streetcars, we don't remember uh, the way things used to be. And we did a lot of things right the first time when we built cities here in this country. So um, I want to remind people what the streets were like before the combustion engine came along. Um, this happens to be New York City, but it could be Chicago, uh, it could be Houston. Um, all the pictures sort of look, look the same. Uh, this is uh, Seattle, actually, a smaller city. And, you know, we tend to think that congestion is a bad thing. And when you hear politicians in particular talk about it, they say, how do we get rid of congestion? How do we fix our congestion problem? Congestion is actually not a bad thing. My friend John Norquist, who is the uh, uh, head of the Congress for New Urbanism used to talk about this a lot. Congestion is a wonderful thing. It's just a type of congestion. If you have single occupancy vehicles with one person in them spewing out fumes, it's not a very efficient use of space. This is an H. Hirschberg and company down in the right corner there. I bet they're doing awfully well, wouldn't you guess? I bet their business is pretty robust. Um, I want to remind people how we got to work back in the day. And by the way, bikes are not something new. Uh, you see that guy on the bike in his suit? Uh, we used to walk, we used to bike, we took streetcars. We had wooden platforms in the streets so people could get on at grade. Um, this is actually the first electric uh, streetcar in Nashville, 1889. Um, you guys were the first. You guys were, I think, first in the country with electric streetcars. Uh, I believe a good five years ahead of Washington, D.C., which was also one of the first. Um, kids, you know, got to school. This is 1880s. Kids got to school uh, biking, primarily, and, and walking. Up until the late 60s, by the way. And our developers and our electric companies built our streetcar systems with private money. Because if you didn't build a streetcar system to the suburb, which is usually just you know, a few blocks outside of downtown, um, although that changed over time, um, people wouldn't buy the house. You couldn't sell a house. Just like we think now that if you don't build parking, people aren't going to buy that condo, which is not necessarily true. We'll, we'll talk about that. Now then, um, President Eisenhower and the Congress passed the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 with the goal of connecting our states and our cities and making sure that we could facilitate interstate commerce and that Americans had the freedom to travel, which when you think about it is a pretty admirable thing to want to accomplish. And it made some sense. It made a lot of sense. The problem is very quickly, within a year or two, we thought, well, we have this utopian dream out in the suburbs, so let's just drive the highways right through our cities. And when you do that, and you take out the old housing stock, and you segregate your neighborhoods, and you destroy the heart of the city, um, it's no wonder that everybody else leaves. And you've taken out all the streetcars, and that's the main way that people got around. And I learned a lot about this actually talking to people in their 80s in Washington, D.C. who explained to me why they were the only ones left in their neighborhood and all their friends had moved to Prince George's County. Now, post-war, there was a need to manufacture things. Prefab housing, uh, cars, you know, our factories needed to make something. They weren't making bombs and bullets and um, tanks and such anymore. Um, Full disclosure, I actually worked some with, with Bill Ford. Bill Ford is the founder of Fontanales, or a, a co-founder. And uh, he would agree with me that the automobile is not the future, actually. It was at the time, for a brief moment, but not necessarily in our future. And the marketing was so good that you, like, like this looks like a picture of, of new urbanism, right? It's just clogged with cars everywhere. But otherwise, it's, it's a beautiful photo. So along with the um, production of automobiles, we obviously have other ramifications. Um, there's a direct correlation between the number of cars bought and the number of people killed. Who knows how many people are killed on the world's roads every year? 1.24 million people. It's the biggest health epidemic we have. It's the leading killer of people 15 to 29 worldwide. It's not AIDS, it's, uh, uh, it's not war. And it's actually the number one killer of teenagers in the United States. So it is truly a health epidemic. But we've accepted it as the cost of doing business. Because culturally, we've been sold, basically, a bit of a bill of goods. And we've all bought into it. We killed the streetcars. And I can tell you, in Washington, when I went to try to rebuild the streetcar network, 
It cost eleven billion in twenty ten dollars to try to put back what we had, um, and we just paid over like, like like most places, and we built the suburbs. Now, in our defense, we did think that this was sort of the American dream. We thought living on top of each other was not ideal, living in dense areas, and uh, having more space in a yard and a cul-de-sac where your kids weren't going to get run, run over by a car and they could play seemed like a really good thing at the time. Um, at a certain point, we actually surpassed home ownership with car ownership, and we left the jobs downtown, though, which is interesting to me. I don't know why we did, but I think it was just, it was hard to move all that commerce out to the suburbs, and it sort of would have defeated the, the purpose. So there were a lot of ramifications, a couple hours of traffic every day instead of with your kids, your family, um, the environment was not so good, and the cities weren't so safe because they were imbalanced. They didn't have mixed use anymore. People weren't living down there, and they were ghettos with offices. Now in Europe, they had a, a bit of a wake-up call pretty quickly. Uh, and they said, wait a second, we think we made some mistakes. Our roads are clogged. And particularly in Northern Europe, there were actually major protests in the streets when kids started to get run over and killed by cars. And they said, wait a second, this is a moral crisis. This is a real issue that we have to address. We can't be running over our kids to get to work. Now, we took a different tact, and we sort of continued uh, down this road. Um, and this is basically where we are now. So. Now that we've gone through the history and some of the depressing stuff, let's talk about some of the things that are happening, happening now. For one thing, we are re-urbanizing at a rapid clip. And actually, in, in the US, it's starting to level off already. And part of it's because we don't have the density, we don't have the transit. It feels like we're growing fast. But compared to Asia, we are literally stuck in the mud. Um, and keep in mind that they have a limit on how many kids they can have. So this is in 26 years in Shanghai. And um, that's what you can do with density and high capacity transit. So what's happened here in this country though, and part of it is generational, part of it is people are moving back to the city, real estate's getting expensive. We're really moving from a period from 1950 to let's say 2000 of hyper consumption. I mean, I remember in 2000 people were buying giant SUVs still in droves and in, in cities. And uh, we're really moving to more of a um, me, from a me economy to a, to a we economy, where people are looking at the assets and saying, do I really want to own that, or do I want to rent it, or do I just want to use it occasionally? Does somebody else have excess capacity that I can use? The other thing that we really worked on when I was the vice president at Zipcar about 12 years ago is educating people on the true cost of car ownership, because we tend to think, hey, we bought the car, it's sort of a sunk cost, right? People don't realize in a city it costs about $900 a month, according to AAA, to keep a car. When you add in depreciation, accidents, gas, storage of your car, all of that stuff. Storage of cars is, is a big opportunity, too. Now, when we partnered with the city, and my book, Startup City, talks a lot about true public-private partnerships, which fundamentally are built on relationships and understanding. It's not just all contractual. And coming from the private sector into government, and, and working uh, in two different governments running transportation, I learned that there was a lot of distrust. But I already knew this from my zip car days. And we had a forward thinking transportation at Dan Tangerlini, who later drafted me into government, who allowed us to put zip cars on the streets in designated public space for a private service. And it basically made us profitable. Uh, but it also got cars off the street. And in between 2000 and 2010, in Washington, D.C., we had a 3% increase in population and a 6% decrease in motor vehicle registrations. Some of that is Zipcar. Some of that is Metro. Some of that is bike share happening. You know, there's lots of things. You have to give people a web, a network of options. And now we have lots of private options, like Lyft, which I understand is moving part of their headquarters here. Uh, and Lyft is a great company, I think, because they're innovating at a fast rate, and they are partnering with transit agencies and they understand the relationship between the first and last mile of transit and the fact that they can be a feeder to high capacity bus rapid transit, light rail, uh, commuter rail, subway. And government, just I'm telling you this, just in the last six months, is really starting to open their eyes to partnering with these companies versus fighting. 
And I'm not saying they shouldn't fight them sometimes, because you can't let the private sector dictate the terms to government all the time. There needs to be a true partnership. Um, Airbnb is one of these on-demand on sharing economy companies that just figured out that people have all of this empty space. These I call them lazy assets. So you have a four-bedroom house, you're one person. You could be monetizing those three other bedrooms in D.C. for probably $2,500 a month. So not only are you paying your mortgage probably, but you're making a profit on it. And somebody else is getting a place to live. So they announced, actually uh, Marriott is not suffering. Marriott, which is based uh, just north of D.C., announced that they're adding 30,000 rooms next year. So they're not hurting from Airbnb. Now Airbnb came out the same day and said, we're adding 30,000 rooms next month. And we don't own any of them. So this idea of platform is very important. This idea that you can have a platform which could be space, it could be technology, much of it is technology, and you can leverage all of these assets. So it's not just the private sector that's innovating. We recognized in DC in 2010 and in Chicago in 2013 that the private sector was not going to just invest in something like bike share, because they didn't know if it could make money, they didn't necessarily believe in it completely, it hadn't been proven yet. So we went out on a limb and we in the federal government funded the capital in investment in these. By the time we got to Chicago, the private sector was willing to come to the table and take on financial risk for operating profit. And so if, if the system's not profitable, the private operator doesn't make any money. Uh, we guaranteed uh, certain, uh, well, we guaranteed to break even for the first three years. So we worked with them. And often, the relationship is contentious. Bike sharing, by the way, is everywhere including right here in Nashville. Now, I think it should be at least four times the size. And when you think about, so we launched Capital Bike Share in Washington, D.C., 100 stations for 1.25 million of local money. That's less than it costs to pave a mile of street, not to build a mile, just to repave the street. It's nothing. But it's a very visual, high-quality option on your streets for people. And people are starting to realize, wait a second, you mean I don't, have to, I don't have to go to the gym? I could just ride to work like we used to 100 years ago? Yes, absolutely. When I was in the Netherlands, um, you know, two thirds of trips are, two, two thirds to three quarters of trips are by bike. Everybody's thin, nobody goes to the gym. Now granted, they're all a foot taller than me, as I was saying last night. Um, so that helps. But they sort of realize that their quality of life is better. Their roads aren't clogged with cars and they've started to shut their downtowns automobiles. Um, this is a great gift because it shows fundamentally from a geometrical standpoint what the problem is out there. Why transit is so important no matter how many autonomous vehicles or, or other cars you get out there. And by the way we will have autonomous buses and so on and so forth. But it's a matter of throughput and geometry. And you need high capacity transit. And you need high capacity transit nodes. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So the other thing <coughs> that we're doing in cities is we're looking at where was our streetcar? Where was our, our rail network for industry that maybe has been abandoned because we don't have the manufacturing downtown? And let's use that space for something else. In this case, I asked the mayor, Mayor Fenty, I said, could we put a bike lane in the place where we used to have a streetcar. He said yes, to my surprise. And uh, there's a great story in the book about how we did it, some of the mistakes we made, and how the mayor was allowed us to make mistakes, which is so important in any organization, particularly in government, where we're so risk averse. We're so scared if we stick our neck out, we're gonna get judged, we're gonna make a mistake. It's basically very little upside and a lot of downside, right? unless you have a leader that allows you to make mistakes, and then it can really filter down. And when you set up the mistakes on purpose, which this was not, but when you go to the public and say, we're gonna try something, we're gonna, we're gonna put in a bike lane downtown, because we know that if people um, have a, a link to downtown, 60% of people said, I will ride a bike, versus the 3% that ride now. And so, if you try something and you tell the public, hey, we're going to put in this two-way protected bike lane, we're going to see how it works, if there's a problem, we can move it to another street, and guess what, you almost never have to move it, because it, it works. Um, and by the way, all these projects are safety projects, because you're making it easier for pedestrians to cross the street, 
We added technology in this project, so there's turn pockets and there's sensors for the cars and sensors for the bikes, so it triggers the lights when a car hits it. So the throughput on this street, on, on Dearborn, in the loop in Chicago, is better now than it was before, even though we took a lane of traffic. And I call these win-win-win projects, because we tend to think, okay, any project like this, there's going to be winners and losers. The cars are going to lose, the bikers are going to win, there's not that many people on bikes, or there's not that many people taking transit right now. If you work hard on the design, and you add some technology in, they can be a win-win-win. You can actually help the automobile throughput. You can make the pedestrians safer and give a place for bikes. Because we used to have streetcars here on Dearborn. I was in my friend Ed Reskin's office in uh, uh, San Francisco, and he was talking, and I was ignoring him, just looking out the window, amazed at their new Market Street. Um, this is an important concept, induced demand. LA has learned the hard way. You cannot build your way out of auto congestion. They have 24 lane highways, and they've added more lanes, and then you see the cars driving in the grass. I mean, you cannot build your way out. You cannot build enough parking, because people will fill it immediately. You build bike lanes, people will fill them with bikes. You build highway lanes, they will fill them with cars. Market Street, it's a six lane street. There's only two car lanes with a 10 mile per hour speed limit. This is at rush hour. Where do you think the people are? The people are on the trains that come down the street, on the high capacity buses that come down the street, or they're riding their bikes. It's uh, maybe not, not the best picture because I could have had some people in there. But fundamentally, people want to be on complete streets. Um, and this is our bus rapid transit uh, project in Chicago that's uh, being constructed as we speak. Um, that is truly a complete street. We've, t we've taken a car lane and put a a platform in. But my prediction and what we um, projected is that the throughput for automobiles, even though we have two fewer car lanes, will actually be better. And we have to remember that this is a system. So if this street is, is more of a transit-oriented street, the cars may go to the next street. So we modeled it, and we don't think there will be any impact. So let's talk about how we get to where we need to go. For one thing, the Transportation Department, or the Public Works Department, whatever it's called in, in your particular city, needs to stop focusing just on engineering ways to move people as fast as possible through the city. Because that was the suburban mentality. That was when cities lost their confidence and became the secondary places where people just worked, and they didn't want to be, and they wanted to get in and out as fast as possible. So now, this is what we focus on in departments of transportation. We focus on everything else. If you look at um, <clears throat> press conferences online for me and Mayor e Emanuel in Chicago, we never talked about transportation. We talked about people's health, we talked about sustainability, we talked a lot about economic growth. Those are the things that people care about. And we would put together very aggressive plans in both cities with about 150 metrics that we committed to hit in a two year period. Why two years? That's a politically viable time frame. You got to motivate your staff to get things done quick. And um, you may only be there two to four years. I, I thought the mayor of Fenty in D.C. was a shoo-in for re-election when I started, and he lost the election. But we still got a tremendous amount done. We launched Capital Bike Share with 100 stations. It's now at 350, and it's in three states. And it's never going away. And it's really about change management. I mean, fundamentally, it's about managing this change in the communication and the outreach and the funding and digging deeper to make sure that it's a win-win-win. So I talk about all these things in the book. The other thing is fundamentally it's about redesigning around people instead of a particular mode, particularly cars. What do people want? What is more of a people-oriented street? We were walking around here and one of the guys from planning commented to me, look at all the high rises going up and the cranes, and he said, notice this is a three-lane street here. He said, it's not happening over there where the six-lane street is. The developers want to be over here. Because this is where the people want to live. They don't want to live over there on a speedway. It makes sense. We just don't think about it. Or not every day, at least. So in Chicago, we said, OK, we're going to prioritize people. Because we were born with two legs. And this has been the main form of transportation for tens of thousands of years. And then the horse, and the steam engine, and the combustion engine, and so on and so forth. But also, the transit user, the cyclist, and the auto user, they're all pedestrians. And we need to look out for the most vulnerable people in our population, young people, 
older people, disabled people. If we plan for them, everybody else will be fine. We also need to think about the carbon intensity of travel. And it's sad that in this country, this has become a political issue. We're the only country in the world where this is a, an issue of, po of politics versus science. But we have a serious problem. And density and getting people to walk and bike um, and take transit has a big impact on our quality of life. By the way, fiscally, let's say you are fiscally conservative versus liberal. If you're fiscally conservative, we need to build more transit and we need to get people walking. The healthcare costs alone are staggering of people being sedentary and sitting in cars. Now up in my neck of the woods in Washington, we've had this funny story that you may have seen on TV about the parents who got in trouble for their kids walking to school in Montgomery County or walking to the park alone. When I was a kid, I walked alone everywhere, rode my bike everywhere in the 70s. But these days, it's become something that people literally don't do. Now, in some places, like I, I was in Texas last week, there are places where there just is not a sidewalk network. Um, so we're telling people visually, do not walk here. Um, but look at the difference just since I was born in terms of how people, how kids get around. And then look at the effect. I'm not saying food doesn't have some effect as well, but look at the effect. These are kids, so on a percentage basis, that's a big difference. So I'm on the board of NACTA, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And one of the things that we've done is put together urban guidelines. We've been relying on the suburban guidelines from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s for too long. So we have tr been trying to use those to fit a square peg in a round hole. And it's not what people move to cities for. They don't move to cities to have parking lots and wide streets and cars buzzing around 50 miles an hour, right? And I, I'm a business person, I'm not a planner or an engineer, but you have to look at what the customer wants ultimately. And the customer in cities, particularly younger customers and empty nesters, if you look at the data, they want the same things. Walkability, they want a grocery store within a block or two of their building, they don't want to mow the yard. And they want everything rolled into one so they can just pay one thing and get everything that they need, right? And so, NACTO has adopted these guidelines, or I'm sorry, NACTO has put these guidelines out and, it's, and the federal government has endorsed them. So I was a fellow at the Urban Land Institute last year, and for those of you that don't know much about ULI, it's a, it's a great organization, an influential organization, also made up of the world's wealthiest developers, and a lot of other folks as well. But real estate is a big business. So ULI endorsed this. Now they endorsed it for a lot of reasons, but fundamentally they endorsed it because it's pro-business. Because we've been sort of told for so long that hey, if you do something that's good for the environment, if you do something that people want, there's going to be an effect on business. We're going to lose money from the fossil fuel business, We're going to, from the car business. People are too focused on quarter-to-quarter -quarter profits and not the long-term health of our economy and the long-term health of our city. Plus, if we can't breathe the air, what does it matter how much money we have? but we'll also be bankrupt. So, they did a study with Ernst & Young and looked at what are the indicators that get, what are the, the investments that the public sector makes that then the private sector will come in and invest on top of? And obviously good infrastructure is key. Now we spend two to three percent of GDP on infrastructure. Europe spends five to six percent. In Asia, seven to nine percent. Okay, and you see Maybe not here, but in a lot of places, I was in Houston, and the infrastructure is crumbling. And Houston's not, not a poor place. So what's interesting to me is when you look at the perceptions of infrastructure quality, public or private, some of the biggest drivers were investing the least amount of money in because even they say the quality is poor. Now, parks and open space are important, but really, we need to build more parking? I don't think so, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So fundamentally, at the end of the day, building safety and building places versus cut-throughs are good for business and ultimately they're good for politics. Sometimes people don't understand it at first, but now we finally have data. When you put in a protected bike lane, when you put in a parklet and take a parking space and make it into a park space, when you make the street safer, guess what happens? People feel like being there. The slower people go through an area, better chance they're going to spend money. 
they're walking, biking, walking to transit, they're driving. Sure, you might have three parking spaces out front. Probably your employees are taking two of them. So people think that the parking space is key to their business. It's not necessarily. Um, I also want to point out, and I love USDOT and have a lot of friends there, but they have been dead wrong for 15 years on their predictions of more vehicle miles travel. They've been wrong. And finally, people are saying, wait a second, are these really good investments? Is it worth $100 million a mile or $65 million a mile to add one more lane on the freeway in the center of the city that's going to kill more real estate value? What's the return on investment? Government does not do a good job of looking at the ROI on projects. Traditionally, the ROI on highways is so negative, if I put the number up there, it would, it would, it would stagger you. But you put in transit, you put in bike lanes, you put in bike sharing, the ROI is huge. The interest in driving by young people, dropping like a stone. They're not interested, they're not getting licensed at the rate that they used to. So what I'm trying to get across to people is that there's a difference between spending, and I wouldn't even call it stimulus spending, building roads and building capacity. It gives you a one-time bang for the buck and you put some people to work and actually investing something that keeps on giving over time. If you look at the Noma uh, area of Washington, D.C., just you know, seven, eight years ago, they built an infill metro station there. And I forget how many millions of square feet of real estate. There's probably 20 towers like this that have gone up. And it's generating $56 million a year and rising in tax revenues around transit. But we tend to say, oh, well, transit's subsidized. No, driving is the most subsidized form of transportation. We just don't think of it that way. ExxonMobil gets 18 billion a quarter or something in uh, uh, tax breaks. So if you tie the land use to the transportation, it's amazing how the economics change. In Hong Kong, the transit agency is a development company also, and they're profitable. Something to think about. So basically, re-urbanization, this is Shanghai again, equals higher return on investment. And there's fundamentally a formula, and it's called transit-oriented development. It's pretty simple. In Chicago, uh, we built a lot of new transit stations. This particular one was in the West Loop. It went away in 1947. For about $45 million, we put back a really beautiful, modern uh, station. And um, within two weeks of opening it, Google announced 300,000 square feet. They were taking two blocks north. A new hotel was announced one block north, and it was named uh, hippest neighborhood in the United States in, in, a, in a prominent magazine. So TOD works, and there's big TOD, mid-sized TOD, and I would say the bike share is small TOD. And there are studies now showing business going up up to 18% around bike share stations. When we started bike share, businesses were like, I don't know if I want that in front of my, you know, blocking my storefront, and then a year later. They were calling us and asking if they could buy a station for $56,000 to put in front of their, 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 their workplace. So government sometimes needs to lead. And if you make it a pilot and say, look, if you don't like it, we'll move it. And in this era of modular design, mobile assets like this, you can do that. Let's look at mega TOD. Um, we have regions that are not linked very well. And we say, we can't afford high-speed rail. It's too expensive. Again, it's become a political issue. I don't know why. But in Florida, when Rick Scott turned back the money, and maybe maybe this was a good thing, but he turned back the money for high-speed rail, Henry Flagler's family, who built the original railroad on the East Coast in 1885, they stepped up and said, wait a second, we think there's a business proposition here. And so they had become real estate, large uh, owners of real estate in Florida. So they said, we're going to divest ourselves of our real estate and we're going to reinvest in a high-speed rail line where our great-grandfather built the original rail line. And this is under construction now, and I predict they will be much richer the second time than they were the first time, benefiting off the real estate that they're building around these nodes. Now, it's not just about mega projects. There's also small projects that have a big impact. We, uh, in Chicago, cut the red tape, so the business uh, community and uh, folks that, that lived in the area could come together and take parking spaces and make them into people spaces. 
And I tell a story in the book of sort of how it happened, how hard it was, because Mayor Daly had sold our parking meters for 75 years to Morgan Stanley. Maybe not such a great idea, because we lost control of our public space. And they, of course, made all their money back in six years. And now this project has, has been more formalized. Um, and basically, they're looking at public space as a platform now. A platform for entrepreneurship, for technology and data to provide Wi-Fi, um, social equity, they're, they're farmers market, so it's program public space meant to create and incubate new businesses. Um, and it takes an understanding between the public, the private, organizations like the Chamber, um, and that's how we built the Bloomingdale Trail. We took old assets that were no longer being used by Canadian Pacific Railroad and we made it into a park uh, that linked five neighborhoods and we did it in four years. These projects typically take 12 to 14 years according to, to the federal government. Um, but Mayor Emanuel said, no, 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 we're doing it now. He, he's like, like, basically you knew if you didn't have it done in a couple of years and he couldn't ride, he said by August 2014 or 2015, if he couldn't ride from one end to the other, heads were gonna roll. And that's actually necessary. Leaders need to give time sensitive goals. Uh, with the, the, the Chicago Riverwalk, we came up with this idea. We looked at the value of the real estate on the Chicago River. They were selling $1 beers on the Chicago River. And I would argue outside of the lakefront, this is probably the most valuable real estate in the city. So we borrowed $99 million from the government on TIFI loan, 3.2% uh, interest. The private sector stepped up, the tour boats, um, and they said they would triple what they were paying. And they basically paid the note for us. Then we uh, built um, retail space, which you can see there on the left, and we've completed three of the eight blocks. One of the businesses um, that opened there, I went and visited a few weeks ago, they're at between three and four hundred percent of plan. And the city gets a cut of all that revenue in this public-private partnership. So it's throwing off profit, and the, the citizens and visitors now have a place that they can spend more time, and the estimates are that when this thing is done, that they can get a percentage of the tourists to stay an extra half day, which could be $40 million in additional revenue to the city. So again, if we start looking at ROI, investments like this start to make a lot of sense. And if we work with the private sector and the public sector together to figure out how do we align our incentives, the private sector is profit-driven, and they need to be. I think the public sector should be more profit-driven, actually. I think the, I think the private sector should be a little more focused on doing good work for people as well, which I think they can, and they can make more money. So let's talk about the future. When I started talking uh, after I left government um, a year and a half ago, Elon Musk said, we're going to have autonomous cars by 2017. Then a year later, he said three months, and then a few weeks ago, they launched it. They just downloaded level three autonomous to people's cars. You can drive from Seattle to San Francisco now without your hands on the wheel. I've ridden in the Google car. They aren't a car company, so they have negated the human completely because they want to get rid of all the fallibility. And they don't need to have a human uh, because they're not a car company with all those legacy issues. Now, to some people, when I put this slide up, I'm, I'm like, really? That's insane. I don't think so. We have problems that we think are insane. You know, uh, um, in 2013 was the first year we had the same number of gun deaths and traffic deaths. So 32,000 of each. Um, I think that this will redefine lower quality transit. It will feed into high quality transit. And I think that um, it's not just autonomous, vehicle to vehicle communication is going to change the way vehicles operate. So we don't need to build more capacity on our roads because we're basically going to multiplex our roads, just like we did in the late 90s with copper wires and made DSL. It's the same thing. It's going to be much more efficient. So services like Lyft and Uber and various others that will come along will be feeders uh, to transit. And the DART, actually, in Texas, in Dallas, is embedding Lyft and Uber in their transit app so that people can compare and see, well, wait, I can go 10 miles on DART for $2. I can go that last mile for $10 or $5 on Lyft. Um, and when, when we think about this, people think that these cars are coming in like 20, 25, 20, 30. But I'm here to tell you that they're coming much faster. 
Nissan will have semi-autonomous vehicles by the end of 2016. Volvo will have level three autonomous in, in uh, 2017. And Google will likely have cars on the road by the end of 2017 in cities. So when you think about it, this idea of us driving may just be a brief blip in history. And it may have been sort of silly when you look at all the traffic deaths and you look at the devaluation of real estate around freeways, uh, wide roads, and parking lots. When I announced that Chicago would be the first Vision Zero city to call for zero deaths in 10 years, people were like, I don't see that happening. But I knew that technology was a key to getting us there. It was redesigning our streets, it was re-educating people, but it was also about automated enforcement, and it was also about autonomous vehicles. And I think what people don't understand is we are on the precipice of a massive, massive technological change, a shift, because of the compounding of technology. Artificial intelligence is amazing. Uh, when I was in Silicon Valley last time, the rumor is that Facebook, Google, and Apple are now automating the programming, not just the testing of code, but the programming of code. So imagine San Francisco without programmers. It becomes a very different place. And this is why government and corporations need to work together for the benefit of citizens. At some point, we will be reinventing capitalism somewhat. Also, in government, we need to really stop focusing on our fiefdoms. And I, I was out with the planning group last night and the MPO, and they were saying how closely they're working with, with Public Works now and the mayor. Like, that's how things get done. Um, I work very closely with the health department and the police department in both cities. Because public safety was just as much in transportation as it was in the police department. So, back to change management. The Kugler-Ross model, the original model for change management, when you look at it, it's sort of funny. It was designed, or maybe it's sort of sad, but it was designed around death and how hard the death of people or things are for us. So, we're going to have to get rid of some of these sacred cows as the world changes. And we're going to have to accept for a while and maybe be a little depressed that Maybe we don't need parking anymore. But then, we have the power to experiment. And when we have that power to experiment, people get really energized and excited. And we can test new ideas. And just imagine if we didn't have parking in our buildings and we had affordable housing instead. When you dig down in the ground to build parking, $65,000 and up for a parking space. That's a lot of money. So your two-bedroom condo with two parking spaces goes from 300000 to 400000 plus there's a subsidy that the developer typically has to get. So imagine if you could charge three fifty and take that delta and put it into affordable housing. And you could make more money for the developer, you could create an affordable housing account, you could up-zone the density, add two more stories in the building so the developer can make more money, and do zero parking. And this is going to happen. It's already happening in New York, D.C., San Francisco, but it can happen here, too. And people say, yeah, but then we're not going to be able to sell the, sell the spaces. Well, the developer already gets it in most places. It's the people in, in the neighborhoods that don't get it. And they think that people are going to bring cars and they're going to park them all over the, these streets. People self-select. Again, induced demand. If you don't build the parking and people really want to have three cars, they're probably not going to move into that building. So you'll get somebody moving into that building that recognizes Hey, we now have bike lanes, we now have this uh, BRT line coming. It'll be great when you have it, because then people can actually visually see it. We don't need that. Also, younger people are, uh, and older folks are wanting smaller spaces. And there's a company now that will actually just slot your apartment right into the building, and then when you want to move to California, they'll have a development there, and they'll just take it on a truck and move it out there. So you never have to move out of your house again. Like they're based in Texas. It's really important to think about future compatibility. I was talking to Jimmy, what's Jimmy's last name? He's a developer. Granberry. Yeah, J Jimmy Granberry last night. And he said, hey, after your talk last time, we were building and we built our garage because we need it right now. But we plumbed it and we basically designed it so it can be converted to office space or rental space. I was like, that's brilliant. So he's built future compatibility into his parking facility. So it's going to cost him very little to then just convert it into housing or office space. And in cities, and I can tell you this is a problem where I live, we need to up them, we need more density, or we're going to push people back into the suburbs. Now the benefit for the suburbs, by the way, is the suburbs have the power to urbanize. 
and this ship. Arlington County, when I moved to D.C., Arlington County outside of uh, D.C. was just a bunch of parking lots, a lot of empty lots, car lots. Um, now it's high density. They built a metro out there. They have a very low parking ratio, and they have tons of bike facilities, and it's become, actually, the, the real estate's more valuable in Arlington than in D.C. now. Because in some ways, they've done a better job. Um, it's also about giving people the information so they can make good options. This is a company I advise, Transit Street. Um, we need to give people public and private options all in one place. There's another great company called RideScout that's doing good work. There's a lot of other technology that's going to affect the way we live in cities that's coming. The um, 3D printer, like you guys are going to laugh. I know I'm going to get some, some funny looks. But at the food show this year, and I love going to the food show, the biggest thing at the food show is the 3D printing of food. Chocolate, Italian food, you name it. Put some raw materials in there, it'll, I mean, it's like you're eating an Italian meal from Rome. It's unbelievable. And I do worry a little bit, what's going to happen to retail when people are printing most of what they need? When you go down to the local FedEx and you trade in your old iPhone and they print you a new one. I mean, what happens to retail? Does it become more of a showroom type thing? It's something we're going to have to deal with. And it's not just little things. Actually, they printed a house in Denmark. Um, so we're going to be able to print just about everything. How does that affect shipping? If we're not shipping finished goods, then we're shipping more polymers and raw materials, and we're recycling everything. Ultimately, there will be business opportunities, and it will be a good thing for us from an environmental standpoint. We're going to be able to produce a lot of our food in the city. Uh, when I left Chicago, one of the biggest up-and-coming companies on the south side was an aquaponics firm that produced fish and vegetables. The waste from the fish fed the vegetables, the waste from the vegetables fed the fish, and they, they were starting to bring all their food downtown with very low transportation costs. With um, uh, aeroponics, you don't even need soil. So Goldman Sachs just put $500 million into this company that's starting to build vertical farms uh, in cities. There's pretty much, I mean, people pretty much agree, unless they <laughs> work for these utilities, that energy will be free within 30 years. Um, renewables and the, the quality of solar and the cost of solar is going down so fast, there's really no way it won't be free. And we'll be producing it at the point of purchase. So when you think about all of these technological changes, I think we get to a few points. One is, we probably will be spending more time in one place. We won't need to travel as much. I didn't even put virtual reality and holographic imaging in here, which will allow you to sit in your living room and beam into a meeting, and they'll physically see you there. And that technology exists now. Or you'll be able to go shopping in Milan and go buy your wife a handbag. And literally, you can be over there picking things out. So that's going to change the way people travel. I know it's the, I'm starting to get those, those funny looks. So, so people will be living, working, and playing more in one place, as they already are. In DC, like I have seven different jobs. I don't have one job anymore. That's becoming very common. People do a lot of different things in cities. So I work out of my house, so I'm trying to build a home office. The city's giving me a lot, lots of guff about building a, a home office, but they're gonna have to change their rules and regulations. And fundamentally, it's gonna be a tough transition, but we're gonna get to a place where the idea of work is different, and the amount of time we spend working is different, and what we do is different. The number one job for men in this country is, who knows, driver. Depending on how you classify it, between 9 and 17 million people drive. Let's call it 14 million. Those jobs are going to mostly be gone in 10 to 15 years. So you can sort of see how we're going to have to shift. But once we get there, I think it could be really great, actually. The Economist and McKinsey did a study. And the two points that stuck out to me is the growing use and sophistication of automation will shift the emphasis of human employment towards creativity and social skills. <laughs> Which is fascinating, because how focused are we on STEM? Well, a lot of the STEM jobs might be automated. And creativity might ultimately be what powers our new companies. In the next decade and a half, digital technology, that's 15 years, <laughs> will dissolve the concept of work as we know. So that's the thing, people talk about Moore's Law, and every 18 months we're doubling our processor capacity. But you combine that with the business models that people are thinking of, 
and it's happening much, much more quickly than you think. So fundamentally, at the end of the day, we have to think about, under all these scenarios, where do people want to live? I did a, a, a project for Mayor Riley in Charleston on, on, on the peninsula, sort of rethinking the, the, the peninsula, and, and he was like, well, what do we do with this space under the freeways? Well, I, I was like, let's move the parking lot for the visitors. Let's move the whole visitor center there, which made sense. People would come off the freeway, jump right down, and then use it for parking, because there's no other use for it unless you tear the freeways down. The real estate value is essentially zero. And young people, they want everything within five or 10 minutes, ultimately. And their job, up to 30 minutes by walking, biking, or transit. So here's, here's the sort of gist of all of it. No matter what happens with all the technology, TOD still makes sense. High density development, high quality transit, lots of people spaces, lots of mixed use, lots of options, lots of retail, and then if we end up working out of our homes all the time instead of 30 minutes away, it's fine. That's still what people are going to want. And I think that's the important thing that I've learned over the last few years. Um, Chris Leinberger, uh, who's a brilliant guy in the area of, of real estate, owns a development company. He's also a professor at George Washington uh, University and president of Locust. did a great report on Boston. He's also done one on Atlanta, I believe, which is more sprawling. But you know, what he's found is 6% of the metropolitan area's land houses 37% of the region's of real estate. 40% of its population, 42% of employment. Guess what, it's all around T stations in Boston. So some people say, yeah, but are we gonna need transit when we have autonomous cars? Yes, we definitely are. But also, it's about creating the type of life that we want around those high capacity nodes. It's not just about moving people. In the future, it may be less about moving people. But we'll have more people, and they will need to move. But fundamentally, ownership is going to be dead, I think. And I think, and this is according to the smart folks at the University of Michigan, this is what people really want. This is a $7 trillion a year business. So this is a big business, providing people connectivity, proximity, and mobility. But we have to make sure that we don't focus too much on this. This is the, the mock-up of the Apple car, and Apple is building a car. But we can't get too focused on the car, no matter if it's high-tech or low-tech. And um, you know, the EU announced that by 2050, they're going to close uh, their downtowns to cars. I've been to Devonshire and other places that are close to cars. All the shipments happen overnight. By 7 a.m., all the trucks have to be gone. They're just people streets, no cyclists in Devonshire downtown, too risky for the pedestrians. Then they have an outer loop where it's cyclists and pedestrians. Then when you get outside of the city, it's basically farmland with bike lanes, you can do anything you want. So that's where they're heading. Oslo announced uh, two weeks ago that by 2019, they're getting rid of cars. So in their world, the autonomous car doesn't matter. They're building high capacity bus, rail, uh, bike lanes, pedestrian space. And really, the problem we're going to have is the affordability of our cities, because that's where everybody's going to want to be. So um, we have this opportunity. This moment in time is an absolutely unbelievable moment in time that we have to grasp and capture and take advantage of. And this would be a dystopic future, where we sort of do what we did in the 1950s, when we got rid of the streetcars, and we just push people to the background because we think we can make some money on cars, or we think it's this you know, optimal way of getting people around. And what we need to do is create the places that we want and fit the technology and the modes of transportation into it. And when you design around people, you end up with great places. And so in the book, I really talk about how to get there. And often it starts with saying yes instead of no. And in government, we too often say no to great ideas. Ideas from lay people, people in their neighborhoods. Um, and it shuts down people's creative process. Um, work should be fun, by the way. Also, we've got to empower experimentation, internal and external. We've got to let people try things. We've got to set up pilots and say, hey, Joe Public, hey, Mayor, hey, Chamber, business folks, we are trying this. If it works well, and I talk about the parking meter system, I think, in, in the book, we tried eight different systems before we made a decision with the taxpayers' money in Washington. 
And now I think we have the best parking system in the country. It's got the highest penetration of pay by phone in the world. But instead of doing a massive procurement, we went out and tried a bunch of stuff and saw what worked. Got feedback from the public, feedback from our experts, then did a procurement. Um, you have to admit when you don't know something. We all don't know a lot of things. I don't, I, I'm up here talking to you as a quote unquote expert. I learn something every city I go to. I learn a tremendous amount. And really the reason I'm a quote unquote expert is because I come talk to people like you. Um, and be transparent with what works and doesn't work. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed the book.